So today we have Professor Bo Jain from University of Pennsylvania for our uh, colloquium. Uh, uh, Professor Jain got his BS degree in physics from uh, Tsinghua University, both physics and math. That was very And then uh, he came for a PhD to MIT, where he finished the PhD in 2014, and then he stayed along for a few more years for a postdoc at that time. And then about uh, six years ago, uh, he went to his permanent regular job at UPenn, where he now is assistant professor at this point. Uh, even in spite of his, uh, despite of his young age, he got a lot of awards and honors, including all young investigator awards from Air Force, Army, Navy, <laughs> and he's also a recipient of a Sloan Fellowship at the International Commission of Optics Prize in 2021. Very that, please, uh, go ahead and start. Thank you. Thank you, Gowen, for the nice introduction. Thank you, Chan, for the invitation. Uh, thank you all for uh, coming to my talk. Hey, can you guys hear me okay in the back? Uh, it's good. Okay. All right. Uh, just uh, today, I just want to share with you some of our recent results and understanding the role of uh, classical nonlinearity in this field of uh, topological photonics. So I'm sure that you have heard of this buzzword of topological photonics uh, by now. It's one of these very interesting, exciting research direction that always seems very abstract. People will tell you that your donut is exactly the same as your coffee mug, but it's very hard to make sense of that. So uh, what we want is to really go back to one of the first examples, or actually one of the most uh, famous examples of topological physics, which is a quantum Hall effect that we learned in really undergraduate ENM when we learned from Griffith. So in this case, what we really have is just a two-dimensional electron gas. So imagine you have this electron pinned in this two-dimensional space in the XY plane, and then you apply a magnetic field along the Z direction. So that's it. Now, if you look at these electrons, they're gonna move under the influence of the magnetic forces or the Lorentz forces. Under this influence, they will go through this circular motion or what we call the cyclotron motions. Now for this electron gas, you can ask the question, is it an insulator or is it a conductor? Now you see the answer actually depends on where you check. If you check in the bulk of the sample or in the center of this electron gas, you see this electron keep changing their moving direction. So they're not effectively going anywhere. They are quote unquote localized in space. So this is essentially an insulator, right? Because electrons cannot really move anymore. But if you check the electrons along the edge of the sample, you see as they orbit around, they keep bumping into the edge of the sample, reverse their direction of movement, and they orbit on. So effectively, they start to build actually a current, but only along the edge of the sample. So you can say that these, these electrons at the edge of the sample is actually forming a conductor. What makes it even more interesting is you realize that this edge current can never backscatter. They can never backscatter because the electrons are required to orbit in this one particular direction, which is determined by the direction of the magnetic field. So in this case, there can be a lot of things said about quantum Hall effects. Here, I just want to mention that the system has a broken time versus symmetry, and that is broken by the application of, of the magnetic field. A closely related phenomenon of the quantum Hall effects is a quantum anomalous Hall effect, which is also known as the translators. So again, a lot of can be said about the quantum anomalous Hall effect or the translators. Here, I just want to mention three things. First, it also supports this unidirectional chiral edge state that you just saw that can never backscatter. And second, this system also has time versus symmetry broken, also by magnetic flux. But in this case, magnetic flux is arranged in some staggered way in space. So on average, there is no flux anymore, okay? So people quickly realize that although this translator was first proposed as a constant uh, concept in electronics, it can also be essentially extended to any kind of wave systems there is, for example, in electromagnetic waves or in photonics. So actually, these were the first proposals of a photonic version of the translator. If you look into the details, you see that both of them break time versus symmetry, but there is a slight difference, where the first proposal breaks it via the gyroelectric response, breaks it via the permittivity of the material epsilon, where the second proposal breaks it via the gyromagnetic response, breaks it via the permeability of the material mu. So next I'll be focusing on the second proposal because they quickly led to the first experimental demonstration of a photonic translator. So normally we know that if you have a waveguide looking like this, so this is where the waveguide usually sits. If you have any fabrication disorder or fabrication surface roughness, or in this case, an intentionally inserted beam block, 
you know that part of the light will be now reflected back and your forward transmission is degraded. But now if you think about the translator I told you in the beginning of the talk, if you are actually operating at the edge of this translator, you see that there is this edge current or this edge mode that can never backscatter. So no matter how many beam blocks you insert along the way of the path, the forward transmission is always 100%. So it's actually the topological protection guarantee you have this robust transport in the forward direction. As you can imagine, it will open very interesting opportunities in a communication system, for example. So this is the first experimental demonstration where it's plotted on the y-axis is the transmission in the unit of dB. The x-axis is frequency. The first demonstration was done in, at a few gigahertz. So the gap of the translator band gap is shaded in yellow where you see the forward transmission, this blue curve can be over 50 dB higher than the backward transmission. So in this system, both time versus symmetry and reciprocity is broken by the gyromagnetic response. So this really was the starting point of this field of topological photonics. And now fast forward some decades later, now we have a lot more interesting topological phases people have identified. We have identified class Z or Z2 or other kind of topological variants protecting different kinds of consequences. We realize them in 1D, 2D, 3D, these are real dimensions, four dimensional higher when you take into account of the synthetic dimensions. We study different kinds of degeneracies that happen going through topological phase transitions. We study the interplay between symmetries and topology. We even go beyond crystalline systems into quasi-crystals or even morphous structures. A lot of the systems were studied under the mathematical structure of a Hermitian system. And this is evident when we look at, for example, the definition of a barrier connection, where we don't need to recognize much beyond the fact we're using bra and cat notation, which is the Hermitian in the product. A lot of success in topological photonics was really driven by the success in topological electronics. However, it is important to recognize that photons being bosons are fundamentally different from electrons being fermions. So it tells you there are going to be very different consequences when you look into topological physics. For example, for photons, you don't have this intrinsic spin degeneracy or the Kramer's degeneracy. That's important, which causes it's very difficult to write down, for example, a Z2 topological invariant for photonic systems. However, photons do have something going for them. For example, photons being bosons, we're not limited by Fermi levels. If you are interested in a particular energy gap, uh, the response in that gap, we can just tune up our laser to that particular frequency and directly probe the response, as opposed to electronic systems where you have to fill up your Fermi energy to this energy gap and then probe the response. Also, in photonic systems, in optical systems, we have very easy access to gain such as the amplifiers or lasers or losses such as in photodetectors. So naturally, we now extend the topological phases into the non-emission world. Now, in non emission world, there are two important differences on the mathematical structure of it. The first one is the left eigenstate are not simply the complex conjugate of the right eigenstate. Second, if you have to use or ditch this Hermitian inner product, instead use this quote-unquote inner product, the unconjugated C product to define all the topological invariants. Using this new invariant definition, we can still identify different topological phases. We can still realize them in different dimensions. Dimensions, we can also study the degeneracies that are unique to non Hermitian systems, specifically the exceptional points. Now, what we are interested in is yet another important difference between the photonic system and the electronic system. And that's the photons obey the Maxwell's equations, which naturally build in this classical nonlinearity, whereas electrons follow the Schrodinger equation, which is a linear differential equation. So we'd like to understand what is the role of classical nonlinearity when we study topological physics. So let me just remind you that classical nonlinearity is very important. Some of the light sources we use are actually built on classical nonlinearity. Now here are three of the examples, and you can purchase all of them, although at probably different price points. The first one is the optical parametric amplifier. So in this case, what you have at the input is a fixed frequency laser at about one micrometer. But the out output wavelength, you can choose it. You can go all the way to down to 200 nanometers, which is in the UV regime. Then you go into visible, into near infrared, into mid infrared, into the far infrared. So you can see that the output, your wavelength, can change by almost two orders of magnitude. And all of them are essentially enabled by some version of classical nonlinearity. You can also have many different frequencies output at the same time. This will be corresponding to a frequency cone, for example, which have their own uses in metrology and spectroscopy. 
In the most primitive example we can think about, you can basically buy from Walmart, you can find it in, even in a green laser pointer. So we know that on the inside, you have a laser diode, which then pumps an NDR laser that emit at one micron, which is the eye, which is actually the wavelength your eyes cannot see. What then happens is you have a quadratic nonlinear material or a Chi2 material on the inside, the frequency double that into the 532 nanometer, which is a green laser eventually see. So what we're interested in essentially to bring in this classical nonlinearity and ask what it does it do to the topological physics. Now let me be more scientific about it. Topological phases or invariants are always defined in eigenvalue problems. If you look into the problems that have been understood so far, these are all eigenvalue problems of the Maxwell's equations describing a linear optical system that's not changing in time. What we are interested in is a nonlinear optical system that's dynamically driven in time. And we're asking what are the new phases it can permit. A good example to keep in mind is essentially just a nonlinear photonic crystal made of some Chi2 medium or quadratic nonlinear material. This could be lithium nitride, gallium nitride, gallium arsenide, transition metal dash carbonide, or your own favorite version of a Chi2 medium. What makes it interesting is that you shine it on it, a periodically modulating field. This is another laser which periodically modifies the permittivity on the inside. And we're asking what are the surprises we can find. The biggest and actually the first surprise we find out is that the Foucault eigenvalue problem is necessarily non-hermission. In this case, the non-hermission doesn't mean material losses. It means something else as explained later. But there are very simple conditions we can write down, guarantee all the eigenvalues to be real. So this is actually very useful when you think of topological consequences. After I build the theoretical framework, I'll show some of the topological phases we have identified in this driven nonlinear system. And then I'll switch gear and talk about the experimental demonstration of one of the topological phases, which is the Foucault translator that I told you in the beginning of the talk. Okay, at the end, I'll present all. So let's get started. Before I can talk about the band structure of a driven nonlinear photonic crystal, let me review what happens in a linear photonic crystal. In particular, what symmetry does it have in space and in time? If you think about it in time, this linear photonic crystal is not changing at all. So you have continuous translation of symmetry in time, which transforms into frequency, it tells you frequency is preserved. In space, however, you have this unicell gives you a discrete translation of symmetry. You can solve the band structure and plot it as a function of frequency on the y-axis as a function of momentum k. So then maybe you can have two bands. Let's say you have a red band at higher frequency, a blue band at lower frequency, and they're not crossing with each other. Next, let's turn on the driving field. In this case, you see that in time, because of the periodic driving field, the permittivity is also changing periodically in time, which means in time, you also only have discrete translation symmetry. And that, if you do a Fourier transform, it tells you your frequency is conserved up to the modulus of your driving frequency. In other words, all of these bands will start to shift up and down, generating side bands shown in dashed line, which are also known as Foucault bands. Now, interestingly, two of the Foucault bands are actually crossing with each other. And we know that bands don't like to cross. What they like to do is anti-cross and open a new gap. So this new gap, which is known as a Foucault gap, is what we are interested in. We're interested in the Foucault gap is because we have all the control over it. We can control how big the gap is by changing basically the driving field. The harder or the stronger the driving field we have, the stronger these two modes couple to each other, the larger gap they open. We can choose where to open the gap. For example, by changing the driving frequency. If we drive the system at a higher frequency, the gap will open at momentum points further away from the center. We can also define the topology of this Foucault gap, as I'll show you later, by simply choosing the polarization of the drive that we use. So we can send it into different topological phases using different polarization of the drive. Okay. So next, yes, let's be more scientific about it, and then we can write down the eigenvalue problem of the Maxwell's equation. This corresponds to a linear photonic crystal. As we know, it's a generalized eigenvalue problem. It reads a psi is equal to omega b psi, where psi is eigenstate. It's a six-component vector. You have electric field on the top, auxiliary field on the bottom. B is your matrix. It's a six-by-six six matrix. On top left, you have permittivity epsilon. On bottom right, you have permeability mu. If you solve this for a generalized eigenvalue problem, you'll get a, your uh, frequency omega. If you plot it, omega is a function of k, this is the band structure you usually get. 
What may be seemingly a bit strange is that I'm keeping both positive frequency branches up here and negative frequencies down here, which is very natural because the electromagnetic wave is a classical wave. It means your solution is all real. If you take a real function, do a Fourier transform, the moment you have plus or positive frequency in positive k, you necessarily have negative frequency in negative k by complex conjugation. And because they are usually simply related to each other, we usually represent the positive branches only. But in this case, as I'll show you later, it's very nice to keep both positive and negative frequencies. Next, we turn on the drive. Now you see this. And there are a lot of assumptions that are all written down here. This general eigenvalue problem looks very similar to before with only one change. That is, in your metric over here, you need to account for not only the linear permittivity, but also the nonlinear permittivity. And now, as I mentioned, I'm using a chi 2 medium, which means that the nonlinear permittivity is actually changing as a function of time. So now your eigenvalue problem looks like a psi is equal to i partial t b t psi. I partial t is a Hermitian operator. Bt can be a Hermitian matrix, but they can never commute with each other. It's the fact they don't commute with each other tells you this is necessarily a non-Hermitian eigenvalue problem. And by the way, this is not a, a, a phenomenon you can actually see in electrons, which is actually an eigenvalue problem. So next, what we do is we solve the Fouquet eigenvalue problem. I won't tell you any of the details, only to tell you what we solve for. We solve for two things. One, we solve for the Fouquet eigenvalues. And second, we solve for Fouquet eigenstates that are embedded in these coefficients. Because both of them actually are important for us to define topological invariants and topological phases in these driven systems. Instead of bothering with these mathematical details, let me show you one of the most simplified examples there is. And there are a lot of assumptions that are all written down here. So essentially what you have is just you have two bands. One at frequency omega 1, the other one at omega 2. You are driving exactly at the frequency difference between the two of them. Then your problem can be simplified into a two by two matrix eigenvalue problems. But they can already see many of the interesting features I showed you before. First, it is not Hermitian, where you realize that this is zero, but that is not zero. Second, you can actually calculate your Fouquet eigenvalues, and you can see that the difference between the two of them depends on how strongly these two modes couple to each other, basically this V21 parameter. So that's actually what we knew before, right? The stronger you drive, the stronger they couple, the stronger they couple, the larger gap they open. Third, you realize that this spectrum is not necessarily real. It is real when you couple two positive frequencies together or two negative frequencies together. So it becomes complex when you couple a positive frequency to a negative frequency. So how do we understand that in what cases you have real spectrum, in what cases you have complex spectrum? It's actually very intuitive when you think about what is the physical process happening in your system. When you couple two positive frequencies together, it means that your driving field, although it can be very strong, each photon carries very little energy. All it can do is to shuffle an omega-1 photon into an omega-2 photon or vice versa. So essentially, you have this sum or different frequency generation process happening where the energy may be changing, but the photon number is preserved. So you can still rewrite your Maxwell's equation using photon number basis, and the photon number basis tells you these systems have to have real eigenvalues. On the other hand, if you're coupling a positive frequency to a negative frequency, it tells you your driving field is not only very strong, but each photon carries a lot of energy. It will split into two photons, one at omega-1, one, one at omega-2. This is essentially a chi 2 based optical parametric amplification. Both beams are growing exponentially, and therefore you'll have complex eigenvalues. So by the way, this is also a very unique thing to a driven photonic system, because you can have the possibility of one photon goes in, two photon goes out. But in electronic systems, no matter what you drive, is always one electron goes in, one electron goes out. So that also doesn't happen. OK, so now I understand the basic idea. This is a non-hermitian eigenvalue problem. I can define the topological invariance based on the Fouquet eigenvalues and Fouquet eigenstates we saw. But now let's think about the topological phase we talked about in the beginning, which is a translator. In the translator, it's critical to break time versus symmetry. Now, what does it mean to break time versus symmetry in a dynamically modulated system that's in time? So that's the first question we have to answer. There are two ways to answer that. The first one is mathematical one, where you just look at this operator B inverse A. You ask, does it commute with time versus operation or not? If they commute, it preserves time versus symmetry. It breaks, then it doesn't commute. 
So in this case, the mathematics tells you that if you use a linear porous drive, you preserve timeless symmetry. But if you use elliptical porous drive or circular porous drive, you break timeless symmetry. That's what the math says. But next, let me show you a more intuitive way to understand that by analyzing the temporal evolution of the optical axis. So the material eventually settled with is the aluminum gamma arsenide. If you look at the linear permittivity, this is the isotropic medium. So it's basically some epsilon zero times identity matrix. If you look at the optical axis, you can say these are just x hat, y hat, z hat. Now let's turn on the driving field. If the driving field comes from the normal direction, your x component of the drive will couple to d41 and modify these two terms in your permittivity tensor. Your y polarized drive will couple to d52 and change these two terms in your permittivity tensor. So now your permittivity tensor is going to be changing as a function of time. But what are, where are the instantaneous optical axes? Uh, how does the optical axis evolve as a function of time? That's what we want to understand. If we only have a linear porous drive, say only y porous drive, then you only have these two terms. If you diagonalize this matrix, you see that one of the optical axes is around z, and the other two are oscillating. One of them is oscillating about x, and the other one is oscillating about z. Next, we turn on a circular porous drive. In this case, you have not only these two modifications, but also these two modifications, and these two modifications are out of phase because you're driving with a circular porous drive. If you diagonalize it, find your instantaneous optical axis, you see one of them is around z, and the other two are spinning, spinning in the xy plane. So how do we understand that this oscillation behavior preserves time versus symmetry, but the spinning behavior breaks time versus symmetry? The easiest way is just take a recording of what's happening here, put it backward on your laptop, and compare it with the physical world. If they are identical, then you preserve time versus symmetry. If they are different, then you break it, which is the same happening in the pendulum part. If you look at the pendulum part, you see the pendulum is oscillating. If you're backward in time, you see it's still oscillating. It's the same as the physical world. So this is why this oscillation behavior will preserve time versus symmetry. But if you look at the clock part, you see it's spinning. And if you play backward in time, you see it's spinning, but in the reverse direction. So that tells you why the spinning behavior will break time versus symmetry. Next, I want to clarify what is spinning. So certainly, it's not that we go into the lab, we take this chunk of uh, aluminum garnet arsenide sample, and we spin it mechanically, right? So we're not strong enough to spin it fast enough. What's really spinning is that we take this driving field to dress each of the garnet arsenide sample or each of the molecules to make it as if they're spinning in position. And this spinning can happen at your driving frequency, which can be on the order of a few hundred terahertz. And that spinning behavior to me is really quite fascinating because it can happen so quickly. Okay, so now we understand there is a Fouquet eigenvalue problem. I know how to break time with symmetry now using elliptical porous drive or circular porous drive. Let's say put it all together to realize a Fouquet translator. Okay, so we went through different iterations of the design. This is the latest design. I'll show you this one because I'll show you later the experimental results based on this design. So as I mentioned, we're using aluminum gallium arsenide photon crystal on a silicon dioxide substrate. So we can first solve the linear band structure that is frequency on the y-axis as a function of momentum k. So on this side is kx, on that side is ky. So in this linear band structure, there are two sets of bands of interest. The first band is this high frequency band, this black line that's curving down in spectrum. So this is the first set. And then at lower frequency, you have these two bands over here. They're degenerate at the center of the brain zone, but they become non-degenerate as you move away from it. In order to label these two bands, you can actually label them with different colors by to which polarization they react to. If you use a X polarized excitation, you will be only exciting this blue band over here. And if you use Y polarization, you only excite the red band over here. So this is still the linear band structure. Next, let's turn on the driving field. Once we turn on the driving field, we know that each of the bands will generate side bands, which are the Fouquet bands and the Fouquet bands. Now you can either look at the lower copy where this one generates side band, or you can look at the higher copy where these ones generate side bands up there. So they are identical to each other. We can look at, for example, this copy, and you see that the Fouquet bands are crossing with each other. Now, whether or not they will open a gap depends on what polarization you use. For example, if you use a linear porous drive in the x direction, you see that you open a gap along the kx axis, but the gap is closed still along the ky axis. 
Actually, if you check in the entire two-dimensional momentum space, everywhere is gapped except for two points in the ky axis. So this is essentially a gapless spectrum if you use a linear porous drive, which preserves time versus symmetry. If you use a circular porous drive, on the other hand, you see that more or less, essentially, you restore the fourfold rotation symmetry. So this is why when you look at the kx axis or the ky axis, the gaps are open. And everywhere in the momentum space you check, the gap is also open. And this gap actually corresponds to the translator we were interested in. This is the one that have the unidirectional edge mode that's propagating without backscattering. So how do we know that? This is actually a tr translator. We did two things. One, we compute the barrier curvature, we integrate it, get the topology variant, make sure this trend number is correct. And second, we can also look at the high symmetry index points, look at what are the ind indices we time them together and tells us this band gap we're looking at is indeed topological. So next I wanna talk about how does topological phase transition happen in this system? So for that to happen, you have to change the polarization of your driving field. In particular, if you use a left-hand circular polarized drive, then essentially you are actually at the south pole of the Poincare sphere when you think of the polarization of the driving field. Over here, the spectrum is gapped and you have a churn number of one. So this is one kind of translator. If you use the reverse the one, the right-hand circular polarized drive, which means you move to the north pole of the Poincare sphere, then the spectrum is still gapped, but the churn number is changed. This is a very different translator now. In order to go through the transition from one phase to the other phase, you have to go from the south pole to the north pole, along which you have to go through the equator. And as we know, the equator is where linear porous drive leaves. So this is why the gap has to close when you drive with a linear porous field and then reopens with another kind of translator on the other side. So that was really just one of the examples we have identified so far, because now you actually opened a very interesting play field by introducing these concepts or interesting concepts from topological physics into the rich context of nonlinear materials. For example, we can have other kinds of topological phases realized using other materials and using other kinds of driving fields. We can take an x cotton now bay, drive along the z direction, then this field will preserve this 180 degree rotation symmetry that quantize a dipole and give us a dipole phase. We can also use Gallium arsenide using circular porous drive, give us a quadruple phase, which is another kind of topological phase now, which require this compound symmetry between space and temporal operation. Finally, we can go beyond a weakly dispersive material into a strongly dispersive material. In other words, into exciton polaritons, for example. So in this system, what you can see is that you can actually shine in a circular porous drive to couple to one of the valleys and therefore break time versus symmetry for the axon polaritons via the axons. In this case, what you get at the end of the day is a polariton translator, which also supports this unidirectional transport channel along the edge of the sun. And here are just some of the examples we have identified so far. Okay, so so far I've talked about the Fouquet eigenvalue problem in this driven nonlinear system. I've talked about the topological phases we have identified. And next, let me show you the experimental results. We're basically putting the money where our mouth is. Specifically, this is the topological phase of a Fouquet translator, which again requires a break time symmetry and reciprocity to get to. Okay, so I'm sure that by now you have already guessed this is probably a pump probe measurement where you have a nonlinear photonic crystal over here, and you have a very strong driving field, or a pump field, periodically modify the permittivity on the inside, and then you send in a short burst of the probe field to measure all the Fouquet bands and all the information within, right? But now let's think about what are the requirements for this pump probe measurement. In particular, what's the requirement for the sample, for the pump field, and for the probe field? Start with the sample. What material do we use? we need to have a system with large enough chi-2 response because this is what's happening to open the gap. Now, this material has to have the chi-2 in a form that's very easy to break time versus symmetry. A, good, a, a bad example is actually Tinalbe, where the ZZZ is very strong, but just using ZZZ, essentially you are using a linear porous drive that can never break time versus symmetry. At the same time, the system, the material has to be easy to fabricate using standard etching processes, and at the same time, sustain a high enough damage threshold on the order of gigavolt per meter or so. So at the end, we settle with aluminum gallium arsenide. Now, aluminum gallium arsenide usually have band gap around 700 nanometers or so, which then place requirement on your pump wavelength. 
you have to pump it in the mid infrared around three micron or so. So you are limited by five photon absorption that allow you to apply a field on the order of gigavolt per meter. Now your pump laser also have to generate this field over a very large area, because if your sample is very, very small, then your resonances are not well defined yet. This is a band structure we're looking at. So we have to cover area on the order of 100 micrometer in diameter. At the end of the day, the Fouquet gap you can ever open is on the order of a few tenths centimeter inverse, which tells you that your beam you are using has to have a very narrow line width on the order of 10 centimeter inverse or below. Even with a transform limited pulse, this corresponds to a few picoseconds. So really at the end of the day, you need a picosecond OPA, which is basically operating in the medium infrared. Finally, you need to send in your probe beam. That's relatively easy. You just need to cover the bands that you're interested in. You have a small time jitter with your pump when you settle with a femtosecond OP. Right. So this is the how the measurement should be done. So next, let's build a lab to, for that to happen. This is how the lab looks like when it's starting in 2018. This is the lab, how it looks like nowadays, uh, actually okay, two months ago. And of course, the lab has evolved quite a lot over the last five, six years. And uh, of course, our lab evolved to its uh, ultimate uh, form during 2021, when Hurricane Elsa hit Philadelphia and my roof started to leak. So then everything has to go under this plastic sheet. Okay, so now we have this, uh, this uh, uh, lab. Let's build a laser system around it. This is how the laser looks like. We start with a ethereum oscillator. This one oscillator is then seeding two amplifier heads. Each one is running at three kilohertz, two millijoules. Each head then send in 1.6 millijoule. The two of them send into the second, second harmonic band compressor. Basically, you chirp one of the pulse positively, the other pulse negatively, and do a sound frequency generation in between. That allow you to get to very strong fields in the picosecond regime, which then drive the picosecond OPA, which is your pump arm. The problem is the idler kind of ends around 2.7 micrometer or so. What we want is really in the mid infrared. So then we do a different frequency generation unit after that, that give us the wavelength we want, but with lower energy than we want. So then we do another stage of parametric amplification ourselves. Eventually, this is our pump beam. Now the residue from this head then goes through a femtosecond OPA, delayed properly in time and space, overlap with the sample, and send it out into a spectroscopy setup. So this is how the setup looks like, but I won't bother with uh, all the details. Here are the experimental results we usually see. So this is essentially characterizing the band structure of a six-fold rotation symmetric photonic crystal. And what you are seeing here are the equal energy contours as I scan through different frequencies. And they can already identify interesting features. For example, there was actually a pair of Dirac points, but the point is that we actually have the spectroscopy set up to measure everything else. Next, let's build a sample, right? So the sample is essentially a very standard process where we have a aluminum garnet arsenide on second oxide kind of fabrication, but this material is kind of new to us when we just started. So we ran through all kinds of examples of uh, mistakes that are listed over here. Some of the mistakes are quite trivial. This is one the, the top substrate got attached to the bottom. This is one basically the sample pops one way or the other. And this is the most non-trivial one. This is when I was sitting in my office doing my work and then my vendor called me and say, we use the wrong chemical, turn your perfect wafer into a smoothie. <laughs> <laughs> so after a lot of effort, eventually we uh, get the sample to work. This is how the sample looks like. And next, let me show you the, the experimental results. Starting from linear characterization, this is just a linear band structure uh, characterization. What's color coded is the reflectivity. And now it's a reflectivity as a function of momentum. So this is kx, this is ky, this is kx, this is ky. The reason why you have these two plots is because we're using different polarization. So over here, everything is horizontal polarized. Everything here is vertically polarized. Now you can already see many of the features I told you about. First of all, there are two sets of bands. One set at higher frequency around 760 nanometer. The other set at lower frequency around one micron. Then you can see this blue and red band where the blue band will only react to the horizontal excitation, the red band will only react to the vertical polarization. And they are, coinc they are actually at the same frequency at the center of the brain zone. The higher frequency band is interesting. It reacts to different polarization in different uh, axes. Along kx axis, it reacts to horizontal polarization. Along ky axis, it reacts to vertical polarization. And this is because the mode right there in the center corresponds to a bounces in the continuum, as some of you know. Okay, so from the experimental measurement, now we can characterize what are the real and imagined part of eigenvalues. 
So the uh, the real part is actually reproducing our band structure calculation. The imaginary part is important because later I'll show you that not only we have a Fouquet system, but also we have entered a strong Fouquet coupling regime. And that is everything is compared to the losses of these resonances. So this will be used later. Now, if you look at the quality factor of the resonances we have got, we get about around 2000 or so. And this is not because the students did a bad, bad job in the fabrication. This is actually limited by the material absorption. So this material, as I told you, has a band gap around 680 nanometers or so. It turns out that even 100 nanometer below the absorption gap, there is still material absorption. And this is consistent with what we have seen in the literature. Another thing we have seen so far is that we take literally this sample, cool it down to four Kelvin, and immediately we see the Q shoot up. So this is really telling you that this is a material absorption limited quality factor that we're dealing with here. Okay, so this is the linear characterization. Next, let's turn on the driving field. Now, again, this is a pump probe measurement. In the probe side, we're just sending in something at one micron. On the pump side, this is where our media infrared drive around three micron or so. So at no time, we send in 760 nanometers, but we like to see its emission. This is emission through the sideband generation, right? And that's exactly what we saw. So you see, this is the experimental results as a function of emission angle. So this is kx axis, this is ky axis. And you can see the emission is exactly happening at around 760 nanometers. This is the strongest when the Fouquet band is crossing with your linear band. Your linear band is this one that's curving down in the spectrum, as I mentioned. And this is the Fouquet band that's curving up in the spectrum. Now, once you see the emission from the Fouquet band, you now can play with it by, for example, changing your driving frequency. If you go, keep changing the driving frequency up, go from 3.2 to 3.1 to 3 micron, changing your pump wavelength, then you see that this linear resonance never changes, right? This is the one that's supposed to be sitting there. And then your Fouquet band keeps shifting up in frequency, as you expected in the sound frequency generation process. Next, we can zoom in on one of them. Let's say we park the pump at 3.1 micron and look at this sound frequency generation or frequency up conversion efficiency. How does my up conversion efficiency scale as a function of pump power? Initially, we think that it should just increase. Whenever you increase the pump, you have more photon being up converted, which is true in the beginning. So you see that this is the up conversion, this is the pump power. So as you start, indeed, that it will go up, but eventually it saturates, beyond which the harder the pump, the lower actually up converted photon you collect. And this is a quite well-known phenomena, either in resonance space, the sound frequency generation or quantum frequency conversion. The idea is as follows. In this process, this is a frequency up conversion process. You send a fixed number of photon into this low energy mode. And then by driving it, you are basically pumping that into the high frequency mode and emit. The most you can do is to have all the photon being on the up state and emit. And if you pump any harder than that, they start to oscillate back into the low frequency mode. So this is why you can write everything down, basically using this, you know, depending on the system cooperativity, right? So it's dependent on four times the cooperativity plus uh, over one plus cooperativity squared. And up converting efficiency obviously maximizes when the cooperativity reaches one. So you can think of that as a nonlinear version of impedance matching that happens when your pump field is around 20 milliwatt or more. So that's when the internal up converting efficiency reaches 100%. After that, you go into essentially the strong coupling regime where photons start to shuffle back down. Now, by fitting this plot over here, we can see that the maximum cooperativity we have induced is about 2.1 or so. So knowing the cooperativity is very important because we actually know what is the coupling strength between these two modes, which is plotted on the y-axis as a function of pump power. So experimentally, we can extract what's the coupling strength at different pump powers, and you can see that it will go up as a function of square root of pump power because the coupling is proportional to the electric field. And the most important thing is you see that we can actually show you this is our entering the strong coupling regime. Uh, people have different definitions of uh, strong coupling. Some people say this is cooperativity equals to one. Some people say it's the coupling it needs to be larger than this, but it doesn't matter when we plot on this plot, you see this, the coupling we have exceed both of them. So now we are really in the strong Fouquet coupling regime, where normally when you think of strong coupling, you think of excellent polaritons, which is some linear dipole coupled to some resonance. What we have here is essentially a nonlinear dipole 
coupling to resonances and the nonlinear that are generated by our driving field. Finally, we can take all the experimental results together and reproduce the Fouquet band structure, which is, and again, the frequency on the y-axis is a function of momentum, kx and ky. And you can see that the Fouquet band structure looks very different when you use different polarized driving field. So if you use a linear polarized drive, you see the gap is again open along kx, but it remains gapless along ky. If you use a circular polarized drive, the gap is open in all different directions. The largest gap we have opened is about 400 gigahertz or so. And this is, as far as we know, the first demonstration of a Fouquet translator using this nonlinear system. Okay, so in this part, I've shown you basically from the demonstration of one of the Fouquet topological phases. And next, I need to tell you what to do next. And uh, just like a cover letter to nature, you need to justify it from fundamental science side, from material science side, and also the application side. So let's do that. So from fundamental science side, I think there are many interesting directions to probe, both on the experimental side and also on the theory side. Experimentally, we just demonstrate the first topological phase we identified. There are plenty out there to be demonstrated. The second one is to realize our pump field really is the most boring kind of field there is. This is a Gaussian beam that's not changing in space or in time. Now we can easily add control to the driving field to give us control over the topological phases. And here, let me give you two examples, which include the control in space and also in time. In space, we can easily change it up into a vertex beam or OEM beam, which then traps a topological real space topological defect in the center. And now around this topological defect, you can study between the real space topology versus the momentum space topology. They also take you away from the class A kind of topological phase we have been studying into a different classification of topological phases. So that I think is a very interesting direction. In time, you can easily take the beam that we're using to drive and chirp it. You send in the blue light first and you end with the red light at the end. When you drive at different frequencies, you can actually induce different topological phases. Now you can have one phase quickly collapsing into another topological phase. Why is that interesting? Because it actually helps us to understand whether the current framework of topological physics is compatible with relativity or not. So let me tell you why. The cornerstone of topological physics really starts from bulk edge correspondence. It tells you that if you have two bulks of different kind of topology, right there at the interface, there needs to be a state. This is really the backbone of topological physics. Now, so far, everything has been studied is when the interface is static, it's not moving, or if it's moving very slowly. Now, of course, the interfacial state will keep up. However, you can ask a question, what's the speed limit of this interface when it moves, and what's the speed limit to the interfacial state? If you think about it for a few seconds, you realize that the interfaces carries no information, it carries no energy. This is why interfaces can move at arbitrary speed. It happens whenever you close a pair of scissors, this interface point is moving up infinitely fast just about when you close this pair of scissors. On the other hand, interfacial state is information. It is energy. There's no way it can keep up when the interface is moving infinitely fast. So at what limit is the interfacial state never going to be able to keep up? That's actually a quite interesting question. And I think that using exactly this technique, we have the right setup to probe in that regime. Next, it's also very interesting to theoretically understand what are all the possibilities out there, what are all the topological phases there are basically doing topological quantum chemistry in this driven nonlinear system. In particular, we now have topological phases that are not protected by spatial symmetry, not by temporal symmetry, but a compound symmetry, which require, for example, spatial rotation and time translation. So these kind of topological phases are gonna be unique to this dynamically driven system. Now, finally, I'm sure that you have understood so far that although this is a driven system, the eigenvalue problem is linear to the probe beam, right? Everything is set up, nonlinearity is in the pump, the probe is a linear problem. How to really understand the topology versus this nonlinear eigenvalue problem that's solved by SOLIDHOUSE? I think that is really the question, but so far we remain largely unexplored. Yeah, I think that's just a very hard question, but a very exciting question. Okay, so these are the, the fundamental science side. On the material side, we have been recently working on basically looking at what are the new materials we can produce that give us interesting nonlinear responses. 
In this particular work, what we did is we take two of these monolayers, 2D monolayers, and we stack them on top of each other with a twist angle. Now, by changing this twist angle, what we can do is directly modify the symmetry of the electronic wave functions. And when you do that, then what you can directly manipulate is a nonlinear response. Now, of course, we're not limited to only two layers. We actually did three layer, four layer, all the way up to eight layers. In this eight layer stack, what you see is a nonlinear response depends on not only the twist angle, but also the stacking sequence. So what is the order you are stacking on top of each other? So essentially what we're trying to do is to prescribe a nonlinear response you want, and then by changing the twisting order and also the angles, we're gonna be able to produce it. So that's what we are trying to do in this work. Now, of course, this idea can be generalized to other systems. We can not use the semiconductors instead of using superconductors. We can look at not the electric nonlinearity, look at magnetic nonlinearity. We can look at not the optical application, but the microwave application. So when you put that all together, then essentially this is a new program we recently started called uh, Synthetic Quantum Nanostructures. And in this case, we are using superconductors as opposed to semiconductors. We're using Josephson junctions instead of interfaces. But the idea is we're building a match material or nonlinear match material in the microwave frequency for quantum native parametric amplifications. Now, finally, the applications. So these two are both with Chang's group. So I think Shishin is now sitting here. A lot of the work is done by, by him. Uh, so the first program we're working on is essentially related to night vision. The goal of this program is essentially to look at the current night vision system. It's very bulky and difficult to use. And the goal is to essentially transform that into something that resembles much more like a classical 007 movie. So this is the results we have seen so far, where you can see this is the incoming medium for light, broadband, going from three micron all the way to five micron. And all of them can be frequency up converted around 700 nanometers or below, which is defined as a visible frequency for us. So now we are still not there yet to have basically thermal images directly visualized by eye. We're not there yet. But through the next phase of the program, we're hoping to push the up converted efficiency eventually to reach that limit. Now, the second program is quite interesting because it kind of overlaps with what we have been talking about. So, so far in the 4K nonlinear optics, I've told you about using very powerful lasers. But you can ask the reverse question. Can you use just a single photon, or at least a few photons, but still have a readable output? Right? That's what's the, the question we were trying to understand. Now, we put everything into calculation, it seems possible because you don't have to drive necessarily 100 micron by 100 micron area. You can reduce everything down to a micron by a micron. You're not limited to material absorption when you go into other material systems where the quality factor of the resonators become much higher. And at the same time, you can use other kind of nonlinearity, for example, in optical mechanical systems as opposed to the Chi-2 medium. So in this particular program, we are using optical mechanical oscillators to further boost basically the effective quality factor of the resonators that actually can, theoretically speaking, should be able to detect few photons that's coming in from the far infrared light. So this is a program we are currently running. The goal is to essentially detect low noise, fast room temperature far infrared photo detectors. Okay, so with that, I'd like to thank people who actually did the work, uh, mostly by uh, my student, Ji Chang, who is graduating soon, and my postdoc, uh, Li He, who is on the job market, by the way. Uh, <laughs> Also, I'd like to thank my colleague, uh, Jim Lee, thank the funding agencies, uh, our collaborators. Thank you all for your attention. Well, thank you. Very nice talk. Very nice, very clear. Uh, so let me open up the floor for questions if you have. Uh, Almost like the uh, implementations of like the topological insulators, like you use Chi two, can you use Chi three? Like you could. Um, the problem is if you look at the absolute change of the permittivity to take Chi three e square compared to Chi two e, usually Chi two e wins. That's our impression so far. Yeah, but if the response is really strong enough, if you can find a material that can give you, you know. If I, uh, basically percentage of the index change that's large enough in Chi three, it would work. I guess I have a follow up question. It's kind of unrelated. But like, I see you play with logical qubits. I guess have you looked into like using photonic uh, insulators or like uh, uh, topological 
uh, Thonics and to like implement this one cube is sort of like uh, transmitted? Uh, no, the qubit system we're currently working on is actually the uh, silicon spin qubits. So these are emitting the microwave frequency, and we're trying to use topological protection back in the radio frequency to manipulate them. Yeah, yeah. The chi three is a is a weird one because uh, if you really look at it, it's a chi three e e star. So no matter what you do, our current understanding is that it will never break time resistance. That's my that's my personal view. Yeah because it always comes in the form of EE star. But of course, if you use EE, then it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So when you were talking about the moving interface and you have the state of the interface, and you want to see if it keeps up, if you move it really fast. It reminds me of uh, idiomatic following. Like when you're, when you when you look at a semi-classical model, some light matter interaction, if your driving field is changing too fast, the, uh, in comparison with some fundamental time scales of the material system, the state of the material won't respond to the change in the driving field because it changed too fast. Yep. So I'm wondering if, do you think that may, before you even start to get into the relativity discussion, uh, will your material, will the state of your system not keep up with the driving field because something is changing too fast? Yeah, I, I think there are two energy scales. The material we're talking about here is going to be okay. Um, I think the chi 2 is the instantaneous response we're using, and then the speed is never going to be faster than that. The real question is, essentially what you have is a carriage state, let's say, or a mode that's leaving inside a gap. As you start to move it, then the frequency will upshift. So at some point, it will shift into the bulk as opposed to be in the gap anymore. So that's actually the limit. The question is, then can it re-emerge on the other side into the other, into the other gap? That's a question we don't know. So we can already see that when we move it too quickly, then it's essentially it can still keep up, but then it goes into the bulk continuum and dissolves. But can, if you keep driving it, can it relocate itself and then you know, it re-emerge on the other side of the band we don't know. Yeah. I have a question yeah. about the uh, So you have a, you have a aluminum kind of layer yeah. uh, that has periodic holes, I guess. Yes. So it's a photonic crystal, right? Yes. A photonic crystal. And, um, and then you drive it at the, 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 the band gap frequency. Frequency of the band gap, you drive at that with a change in the the periodic spectrum, it changes the band, band spectrum itself. Right? Yeah. I mean, the field are strong enough. So it's almost like a like people do two level atom, but having frequency, they have such a strong field that the strong coupling that, that creates the modifies the energy level time, right? Exactly. So yes, exactly. So if you have a two level system, you have two electronic states. They're coupled to each other directly by the electric field. Yeah. So it's the D dot E coupling. Yeah, right. But you also talk about a cavity. I mean, you were yeah. saying that there's a resonance. And there's a cavity, I mean, so it's in there, there's no physical cavity in the no. structure, right? There's right, no, it's a band structure. So when yeah. you talk about the Q factor, it's Q factor of, of resonance you're talking about? It's a resonance, a guided resonance, which is delocalized in plane, but trapped in out of plane direction. Okay. So so I guess the question, main question was, what is topological there? I mean, if you have a periodic structure, mm -hmm. which you drive at some strongly at some frequency, mm -hmm. where is the topology coming into that? Why is it called topological material? Yeah, so at the, at the end of the day, everything goes back to the band structure. Okay. So if you remember the, the edge mode that was propagating on the edge and never backscatter, yeah. it, it's not because the interface was engineered, was actually on the one side of it, everything is engineered. And you can ask what is engineered is actually in the band structure of this periodic structure. Now, for us, it's the same. It's the periodic structure, but now it's actually shining one kind of beam on it. And you look at the band structure of this driven system, right. that carries the topology. Yeah, yeah, I see, I see. Okay, 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 okay. Well, I, I think, I mean, I, I like the idea of what you're doing. I'm just trying to understand the topological connection to that. I mean, that's, but what but, but I see, maybe you can tell me if I'm wrong. Essentially, you were saying that if you if you draw, if you couple only the band with the same positive frequencies, then you are you don't have any gain or anything like that. But if you couple the band which are on the opposite side, positive and negative frequency band, which to me, like saying in like a photo mixing, is a signal that can you get away something when you do. Because you're just there, you're coupling to the E star and not with the E. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's the same. Yeah. So um 
there, there are two things. So one thing is like, you know, in atoms, you have electronic states coupled to by the D dot E. In our case, we have photonic states coupled to each other by chi to E. Yeah, so then this is how the coupling happens. In the atom case, you always have these wave functions sitting exactly on each atom. Yeah. So this is to us an atomic insulator. Yeah. Basically, you put a bunch of atoms together. Each wave function is well understood. Yeah. When you put these uh, semicond semiconductors together, you form these band structures where the electronic wave function itself become delocalized. Right. Now, in this case, then you can have either something that can be reduced to atomic insulator, which is trivial, yeah. or you can have something where the wave function can never go there. Yeah. And that's always delocalized. And this delocalized wave function is the topological case. Okay. Yes. Right. Yeah. And then the drive is that you need to pick a driving frequency, which is low, basically. Right. You don't want to go into the OPA regime. That's yeah. all there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let me ask uh, people online on Zoom. Any question from them? You can either just raise your hand or ask a question, or or you can type on the on the chat if you want to. Yeah, it's like on the other side. Thank you. Thank you.